Prospect House Media. And now, prepare yourself for the only weekly podcast you won't want to miss. Welcome to the Ameritocracy Show with Troy Edgar, live from our studios in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. I am Troy Edgar, and welcome to the Ameritocracy Show. Thank you for tuning in and checking it out. It is greatly appreciated. This podcast examines the conditions for personal and economic growth and opportunity across America. This week, I met with Stephanie Hoagland, U.S. Army Director of the Organic Industrial Base Modernization in Huntsville, Alabama. She discusses her career path and the importance of modernizing the Army and the challenges of securing the funding for a $16 billion, 15-year modernization plan. The Organic Industrial Base, or known within the defense community as the OIB, consists of 23 arsenals, depots, and ammunition plants that provide essential maintenance and repair capabilities for the Army's equipment and systems. Stephanie started her career in one of those arsenals as a physical scientist at the Army's Joint Manufacturing Technology Center in Rock Island, Illinois. She then advanced to the Joint Munitions Command and then eventually led her to her current role within the Army Material Command in Huntsville. Stephanie has had great mentors and shares on how many of these Army leaders have helped guide her and inspire her through her incredible career. This is a great episode for anyone that may be considering serving our country in the military or as a civilian. I hope you enjoy. Good evening, Stephanie. How are you doing? Good. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, here in Huntsville, Alabama, and uh, going uh, on a remote shoot here this week, and uh, really excited to be able to have the opportunity to meet with you and to tell your story and uh, to let people know a little bit about your background. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah. So um, you and I met uh, about... I think 2022 up in Washington, D.C. We were at a big army show that was going on up there. And, uh, you know, having the opportunity of seeing you in action, I, you know, from that that point on, just uh, the amount of uh, the program that you're responsible for now and uh, the different types of activities that you were doing, I was just uh, very impressed. And I thought one of the things that we try to do on this show is really bring a perspective of the federal government to people outside of the federal government. And, um, you know, I used to say to bring D.C. out, but, you know, the fact that we're down here in Huntsville and the command that you're, you know, and where you're responsible and your organization is here, um, federal government is really a lot outside of D.C. And uh, so, um, but uh, what I'd like to do, if we could, a little bit is um, to, to talk a little bit about uh, you, you know, you've ended up and you are now at the, as the director of the OIB modernization. But uh, before that, just a little bit of, uh, of your story of uh, where you grew up and kind of your path into uh, into the army it would be very interesting. Um, well, just it's funny that you say the government's out of D.C. and because we do refer to Huntsville as mini D.C. <laughs> and in many it's instances, so built so up it, here. Yeah, it's kind of funny. But um, and to your point, I don't think folks realize that um, there's a lot of uh, government presence across the United States. Um, uh, I'm in charge of modernization, which is 23 sites that are everywhere from the East Coast to the West Coast. So there's 23 separate installations that are all part of the federal government. Um, but uh, to get after your question, um, I grew up in McHenry, Illinois, which is quite small. Um, it's the northeast portion of Illinois, just south of Wisconsin. Uh, I went to uh, K through 8 in the same building. So I had like a cohort of people that I grew up with um, before I went to high school um, at McHenry West Campus. And ironically, I run into people who went there all the time, even though I'm no longer in Illinois. <laughs> um, from there, I decided to go to college at Augustana, which is all the way on the other side of the state. Um, and for folks who don't know where that is, it's in Rock Island, Illinois, which is actually the Quad Cities. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's four major cities that make up uh, the Quad Cities, which is Rock Island, Moline, Davenport, and Bettendorf. And so two of which are in Iowa and two of which are in Illinois. 
um, which is relevant, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but went to Augustana and got my bachelor's degree in biology and Asian studies, which mm. sounds random, but I did do a term abroad um, in Asia that was extremely exciting and inspiring, and I think uh, taught me a lot about how to be very accepting and, and patient um, as a human being. So, um, When you grew up in Illinois, were you... You know, did, did you see yourself staying there and kind of, uh, or breaking the mold? And, you know, I mean, the fact that you took Asian studies, kind of something inside of you saying, I kind of want to see some other stuff. Yeah. So I don't, I honestly don't think growing up, I thought much about it. I was very um, involved in school and sports growing up. Um, I come from a really big family. I have four brothers uh, and we are all very, very close. And so we spent a lot of time um, as a family unit doing a lot of things together. Our, our family vacations were usually camping mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of, I got a lot of support from my family because I did play travel softball because my parents tried really hard to help me mm -hmm. uh, get into college and try to get a scholarship. Um, I was actually really good at softball, mm -hmm. my opinion, but <laughs> um, I played travel ball for many years. And so my brothers and I got to see a lot of the country because our vacations consisted of going to places like Kansas and Florida and Texas mm -hmm. uh, to play ball. And then we would add a day or two or drive down. And so it was kind of exciting. Um, when I decided to go to college, I was one of the first ones in my family to go. And one of the big criteria was getting a scholarship. Mm. I did get a scholarship from Augie and it was not for sports because they are a D3 school. Um, but when I got to college, I decided I didn't want to play sports anymore. I wanted to kind of refocus myself and do something a little bit different. And uh, your your undergrad degree was in biology. Yes. So, um, and, you know, and I'm sure we're going to get to part of the story where it diverges from that. But uh, at that point, pretty hard degree as compared to business per se. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was your intentions at that point? So for a long time, I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, I wanted to be anything from um, an OBGYN to I thought about dentists and then I went into optometry. And that's what I ultimately settled on was to be an eye doctor. And it was um, my eye doctor actually went to Augustana and she and I developed a great relationship and she let me do a little bit of work for her um, as, a, as a mentor and then um, doing uh, glasses fittings and ordering contacts with patients. And I really enjoyed doing that. So when I went to, to Augie, that was the goal. Uh, while there, I... Uh, racked up quite a bit of debt, as many of us do in college. Um, and I, I did okay dec academically. Um, I mean, I had great grades. Um, I took my tests to go on. But by the time I got to my senior year, I just realized that more school was not something mm -hmm. that I wanted to do. And so I jumped into the a big kid workforce mm -hmm. um, and, and looked for an adult job as a biologist, which was kind of difficult, to be honest, because most people go to school to, for biology to become a doctor or to do research and continue their education and get their PhD or something along those lines. But um, I learned the hard way that biology was a little bit harder of a educational field to find a, an adult career in, but um, ended up getting a job uh, as a physical scientist on Rock Island Arsenal. And that was where my government career began. So you, and that's, uh, so you entered uh, federal service around 2009. Yes. Time period yep. in there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's interesting. So Rock Island, and and for the listeners, and I've been there. Uh, talk a little bit about just Rock Island. What 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 what's the purpose of Rock Island as a as an installation? What uh, from the federal government and the army. So Rock Island Arsenal is actually multiple uh, government agencies. And so it, it's Rock Island Arsenal, but it's not really an arsenal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, where I got my first job was at the Joint Manufacturing and Technology Center, which we call JMTC. And they do uh, manufacturing of all different types of commodities for the Army. Um, but Rock Island Arsenal also houses uh, Army Sustainment Command, which does all of the soldier sustainment and material supplies. And then there's JMC, which is Joint Munitions Command. There's First Army. So there's lots of different um, components that are at all housed on Rock Island Arsenal. And when you when you uh, ended up at Rock Island, you know, you're right on the border of Iowa and uh, Kansas or Illinois. Uh, Illinois I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if there was a sequitur there, but uh, I was just recently reading a book on Grant and uh, on the President Grant back in the day. Um, that that section, uh, there was some activities going on historically back there. I don't know if you uh, if you're familiar with with uh, that you know, during the Civil War, pre Civil mm -hmm. War. 
Um, yeah, they've got a pretty cool museum there that actually show you. Um, they actually housed a lot of prisoners. Yeah. And there was a lot of disease that ran through Rock That's, Island Arsenal. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I did. Because mm-hmm. they have a museum. They have a yes. bunch of different stuff. It's a very there. nice museum. Um, as, as you started working your way, obviously, you come in from more of a science perspective and you kind of work your way. Um, start talking a little bit about Rock Island, and then as you start moving in, and, and we'll talk about some of the jobs there as you move up into JMC or the Joint Munitions Command. So I started my job at JMTC, and I was pulled in as a physical scientist. And what that means basically is that I got to cut up all of the parts that we made to supply to the Army. So when I joined, um, it was when the 119 Howitzer was at its peak manufacturing, um, and the lab was in charge of literally cutting up every component that made that um, weapon system to make sure that it was manufactured correctly. So I started by um, looking at the the cannon or the the two barrels and cutting them into pieces and polishing them and looking at the macro and microstructures to make sure that we heat treated them appropriately, mm-hmm. um, digesting different uh, weld metals to make sure that the, the weld materials were the correct alloy and... Um, pretty much you name it, looking at paint and was paint applied correctly. And so I spent a lot of my first years looking at a lot of technical data packages and breaking down um, the materials science aspect of that. And then doing a lot of analyses when things didn't go right. How do we fix the manufacturing process? How do I uh, go on the shop floor and train folks to look for certain quality aspects to make sure that we don't get to a point where things were made incorrectly? Uh, So I started there um, and actually moved into quality because I'm not an engineer, but I speak engineer fluently Mm -hmm. um, because I work with them my entire career. And so it worked out really well for me because I could go and interpret TDP as Mm -hmm. I can read specifications and and policy and things along those lines and understand what the intent is Mm -hmm. and then work to make sure that we were in alignment with that and then work with the folks in the lab who were a little bit more technical and hands-on. And so it was a great transition for me on how to work with people who are very deep in the weeds and then bring them up a little bit to get them to where we needed to be. So is uh, the destructive testing, all of the activity that you're going through, um, the, the, the parts that were getting either manufactured or remanufactured, can you talk a little bit about kind of the bigger picture of like where the parts come from? A lot of people don't realize, um, yeah, I tell people I, I lead, for IBM, I lead a supply chain business. And cool. they're like, okay, I get it. And it's like, yeah, and uh, we're doing a bunch of Industry 4.0 and manufacturing stuff. And they're like, what's the what's the, the government manufacturer? And so you're kind of at the heart of that, you know, within the OIB and then very similar stuff going on in the Navy and the shipyards. But talk a little bit. I know we're going to get into the structure of what OIBs and plants do, but talk about specifically some of the parts. Where do they come from, you know, in the manufacturing process? So a lot of what JMTC does, because it, it's a manufacturing facilities, we actually make them. We don't do much in the remand. So okay. depots really handle some of the remand mm-hmm. stuff. But um, JMTC would work with program executive offices to um, make complete, uh, in, in my instance, uh, 119 howitzers. Mm-hmm. They did the 777. They've made um, ammo to hang on Humvees. Mm-hmm. They've done um, gunner protection kits. So They get orders in from the PMs and the PEOs, Mm -hmm. and we make them. uh, JMTC is the only place that takes it from um, a raw piece of material. Mm -hmm. We can do everything from cast it, forge it, um, machine it, cut it. We can order in sheets of material, cut it into whatever Mm -hmm. needs to be, and make it into a thing, Mm -hmm. Um, and in our case, weapon systems. Uh, There's a small arms manufacturing cell there as well, and they'll make things like triggers and hammers and... um, it, if you think of it, they can make it. Mm-hmm. We, when I worked there um, in the quality department, we actually did work for the Navy and I did uh, jet blast deflectors, which are very huge sheets of aluminum that we hollow out uh, for lightning purposes. And then they can filter water through them and they go up behind the jets as they take off of um, the ships to, to protect everybody else mm-hmm. on the ship. So we basically would make something from nothing every mm-hmm. single day. And so the materials engineering part was extremely important because you don't want to ship things into the field that aren't manufactured correctly to support our soldiers. I mean, that's the reason we exist is to give them safe things to use in the field. So our job was extremely important. Um, again, just to kind of help the listeners understand. So um, a lot of different companies 
involved in the industry of supporting the, the, the Department of Defense and the Army. Um, and then there's some specific things that kind of get pulled away from vendors to manufacture or what they will call OEMs. Mm-hmm. I was at Boeing for 10 years. You know, we made planes, rockets, spaceship stuff, all that. But, you know, the criteria for the military to bring stuff in to be manufactured in-house um, any insight in kind of what is what what drives that determination? Because on the surface, being a layman, I'll just throw it out there. The things that I can tell are really national security items, things that we have to maintain the capability internally and not be maybe beholden to industry. We need to make sure we maintain it. it could be because of classification or it could be to some very specific materials. Is any more to that from your perspective? There's a whole gambit of why things do and don't get manufactured. Um, the the very correct answer is there's make buy decisions that are done to, mm-hmm. to tell whether or not it's beneficial for us to give it to an OEM or give it to an outside contractor or do it internally. Uh, there's also something um, called core workload, which are just certain skill sets that we need to maintain mm-hmm. so we can be able to surge if we need to. And so we have to keep those core critical skill sets hot mm-hmm. um, so we are ready to because the OIB is a nation's insurance policy. Mm-hmm. We exist to make sure that we can surge when we need to. So we have to keep those skill sets warm. Mm-hmm. Um You'll see a a varying amount of what comes to us. Uh, Anything that's an original equipment, so when things are first deployed, typically stays with the OEM until it gets transitioned into sustainment, which is really why we exist. But we do partner with um, OEMs to give them additional capacity to help them with things that do have certain classification levels Mm -hmm. that they may struggle with. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different reasons why things come. But for JMTC mostly, um, they ended up getting a lot of things that, manufacturers outside of the government struggled with like mm-hmm. the jet blast deflectors came to us because it was a very difficult problem mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it needed very extensive quality assurance and that was part of why it stayed with the government to make sure they were getting exactly what they thought they were because scrap rates on those things were high and they were struggling to make sure that they were getting what they were paying for so it came to gmtc when i was uh, the cfo for dhs um the coast guard and just to kind of give a comparison um I remember going to what they would consider their depot level type repair. And, you know, the Coast Guard got a lot of equipment is kind of secondhand, especially like their helicopters and some of their, um, you know, the the airframe that they deal with. And so the helicopters they got from the Navy and they kind of get breathed a new life into them. And then some of the fixed wing also. And it was interesting as I was out touring one of the facilities that had, was retrofitting one of these fixed wing. It was 20, 30, 40 years old, this plane, and they didn't have parts for it. And so they either had to figure out how to remanufacture, you know, mm-hmm. do additive manufacturing or to find a vendor. And so sometimes um, that that's dangerously low of how the supply base is. So you guys truly are the insurance policy of you know, the ultimate machine shop, right? Yep. In some cases, and to kind of oversimplify. Mm-hmm. Um, before we kind of leave that part and move up into JMC, that the next level of this OIB structure, I thought maybe as a layman, I would just describe a little bit because the the really interesting part of your story is you've moved up the three tiers that the lowest tier plants, arsenals, depots. And so you're at Rock Island and that, and you worked your way there. And then you kind of go up to the next level. If you just kind of give the listeners a little bit of an idea of that. Right. So LCMC is life cycle management command, sometimes also known as MSC, which is major subordinate command. Okay. Um, and they all work for army material command, which is the headquarters and they have 10 MSCs. Okay, so at the very top AMC. The very and, top Army. Uh, yeah, the very top yes. Army, yeah. yeah. Ar- army, then yeah. AMC, yeah. then um, Life and Cycle the, Management Commands. Ten of them. Well, so, there, so Life Cycle Management Command is specific to those that have the installations, and then Major Subordinate Command um, is the gambit of all of them. Got it. So LCMCs would be Joint Munitions Command, which is um, ammunition. Right. Um, TACOM, which is Tank and Automotive Command, okay. CECOM, which is Communications and Electronics Command, and then AMCOM, which is Aviation Missile Command. Got and it. so they manage all, those are the LCMCs that have the 23 specials. Got so it. they manage all of the installations, which are the lowest level. 
Okay. So in the in your story where we're at now, you're moving from the lower level up into that mid-tier yes. JMC. So I'm actually switching from Tank Automotive Command to JMC. Oh, got it. Cool. But admittedly, when I was at Rock Island Arsenal, I did not know all of these things. Oh, okay. Um, which we have recognized is important, and it uh, we've made a more concerted effort to make sure that people understand the command structure and where mm-hmm. everybody fits in. But I think... Not have it. I mean, the army goes through cycles, right? Mm-hmm. And as leaders come in and transition out, things get lost over time. And I mm-hmm. think we're recognizing now the importance of folks understanding all of the different levels and how they impact each other, how they feed into each other. And mm-hmm. that the lowest level, you may be focused on a very specific thing, but as you move up to the AMC and then into the army, it's a, it's a totally different viewpoint uh, with different objectives that you're trying to achieve. Um, so once you get to JMC, that second tier, mm-hmm. um, did you see it at that point as, hey, my career is going the, the right way? I've made it, quote, to the next level. Is that kind of how it, it appears from your your perspective? Yeah. So I think my transition from JMTC to JMC was where I really struggled in my career because mm-hmm. I had to do a lot of internal uh, reflection to determine what I wanted to do with my life. Mm-hmm. Um, at JMTC, I actually was very fortunate and moved from a lower grade individual physical scientist through the QA. And then I ended up going back into the material science as their chief. Um, and so at a lower, lower level commands have lower grades. And so you'll see supervisors as lower pay structure than you'll see at the AMC level, Mm. um, which is the same as you move up into the LCMCs, it's a little bit higher. And then AMC, it's a little bit higher. But at JMTC, admittedly, I was a little bit more concerned about my career perspective monetarily Mm -hmm. than I really was about what I was going to do until I got into a leadership position Mm -hmm. and started realizing how much influence you could have and the importance of some of the work that we were doing. Yeah. Talk about when you made it to to JMC then at that that second tier. What was the first role there? So my first role there was as an environmental coordinator. Um, And I basically learned about all of the 16 sites that JMC has and the, how very different they were mm-hmm. and how different environmental law is from state to state. Yeah. And then there's federal law and then there's also army uh, regulatory policies that apply to each of the installations. And so the um, the number of things for us to look at from an environmental perspective were infinitely endless. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was a very large transition to go from focusing on a single weapon platform or a thing that I was working on to coordinating with 16 different sites to feed information to folks who were higher than I was. And again, understanding the messaging coming from army level and then sometimes even higher, you know, it's like playing telephone. The message changes as it gets down the chain. And so I think one of the things that made me successful at JMC is coming from an installation. I understood where the folks were coming from. Mm -hmm. And I recall being asked questions that I didn't understand the context. And so I'd provide a response that was a simple response. And it maybe wasn't always the right response because I didn't understand what the question was trying to get after. And I think when I moved into that environmental role, which a lot of it was going to the sites and asking very specific questions so that I could answer things um, to be used for folks higher than I was, um, I could communicate better with them. Mm -hmm. And I could get an answer that reduce the amount of back and forth between the person doing the asking and the installation, because I understood if I went there with a very vague question that I was going to get a very vague answer, maybe not the one that I needed Mm -hmm. to be successful. I guess you a question. So um, I know through that process, you had um, accomplished another credential, which was your master's degree in organizational leadership. Mm -hmm. Was was that before you moved into JMC or? uh, It was right before I moved to JMC. Um, So when I was at JMTC, um, I was pushing to try and get into a leadership role. Um, I like change and I like shaking things up. It's Mm -hmm. been something that I've been known for. I mean, I I was really into lean and finding how to make make processes better. And so um, when I was considering going back for education, I was told uh, it would be helpful if I had an advanced degree. Not that I needed one, but it would probably be helpful. And I really had to consider, did I want to go back? and study science again. And being in the materials engineering back, having that as my back base for my job, did I want to go into chemistry? And I, and I be honest with you, I don't love chemistry. <laughs> yeah. it, it was not my favorite. Um, so I really thought hard about what I wanted my master's degree. And I ended up finding St. Ambrose University, which is literally a hop 
over from Illinois to Iowa. Yep. And I took night courses for two and a half years. Um, and I started taking two and three classes at a time to try and get done as quickly as possible. Um, but it actually ended up being really, really, I don't want to say easy, but enjoyable and fun. And I found it easy because mm -hmm organizational leadership just helped enable me to be a change maker and understand the dynamics of people and things like the sense of loss people go through and how to address it and how to get along with different personality types. And mm -hmm. I think not doing a science-based advanced degree and moving into organizational leadership was probably one of the smartest choices I ever made because it's shaped me as a leader. And I refer back to that stuff all the time. I mean, and I graduated with that degree and 2013 mm -hmm. and I still use and quote the authors and go mm -hmm. back to those books and reference the studies and it's I think it was extremely helpful in shaping me as a leader. Yeah a, a thing that I've seen in a lot of these interviews is somebody gained their technical knowledge and I'll just say it that way with their base degree like they were a journalist or an artist or you know went into very specific and then when they got to a certain point in their career um you know, they had to kind of figure a way to get to the next level. And again, this show, a Meritocracy, is about credentialing. And so I just, I, I seen that in your background as I was doing the research is that there was a point where it seemed like, like it, it twisted a little bit into the more business side. And uh, yeah, and I think that it, it's an interesting perspective, like you said, to get the tools that you need mm -hmm. to kind of get to that next level. Um, you know, as you're going through and uh, you're, you know, looking uh, within JMC, um, talk about some of the roles there, um, because, you know, a big part of this we're eventually going to get to is the big step up to AMC, um, which, again, is the top at the headquarters piece in, right below the Army. But if you could talk a little bit more about JMC and what was the opportunity that came up to eventually lead to moving up to the next level? Sure. So I started off as uh, environmental coordinator, and I actually, to be honest, I took a step backwards when I moved to JMC. So at JMTC, I realized that um, it was a very small organization and then I was going to struggle there if I wanted to continue to have influence. And so I took the leap and went to JMC and actually took a step back in my career to give myself that opportunity because I knew that I would have more room to grow because at the LCMCs, they are larger and they have more more breath. So mm -hmm. um, when I started there, I was an environmental and I ended up uh, leading a couple of different teams, uh, one of which was called um, the Transformation Action and Advisory Team. Um, and their main role there was to be a conduit between leadership and the workforce. And I wanted a chance to influence what happened at JMC. And I started off just being a team member. And within a year of being there, they moved me into a deputy role. And then I ended up taking over as the director of that. And actually as a lower grade, which um, I found exciting because I had a lot of influence, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I also, it was great because I got to see the command make changes that were positive for the workforce. And mm -hmm. you could see a change in the way that, that the workforce was communicated with. It influenced the way that we did our, sta our um, annual standards review. Uh, and so it was a really great opportunity for me. And I think it showcased that I had the ability to do more than just what I was doing at the time. And so um, I ended up moving into the quality department there, um, which was actually quite different than Mitchell's engineering because it was quality assurance um, ammunition, which looked at the TDP for ammo and was more about gathering seed rolls and contracting actions than mm -hmm. it was about doing any of the testing. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know that at the time and I was slightly disappointed admittedly, but I also really enjoyed the work because I got to travel to all of the installations, which I hadn't really got mm -hmm. to do previously. And that's, you know, I started to develop my love for the Joint Munitions Command and all of their uh, installations. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, again, another kind of parallel is at that time, you're getting the backstage tour of all the facilities. Mm -hmm. You're coming in with a purpose. So people are taking the time to kind of show you what this, you know, what do we do here? What's going on? And then again, you're building up your eminence and knowledge of your organization. And, uh, and, and again, I'm just trying to claim some ground because if you make it through and kind of get up, this is the power of the procession to AMC um, as you're going through. And I, I guess one last observation that I had was, 
you know, you did do the the tour of duty around environmental, you know, and I've been to some of the OIB depots and plants and the environmental thing is a big deal within the federal market. I'm responsible as the, the key person for sustainability. And so I, I'm sure with that type of background, too, and sustainability being a big thing right now with the executive orders that, you know, it, you also kind of have a sensitivity to what these plants need to go to, the big strategy. It's another thing that comes from Army, big Army to AMC. Mm -hmm. And since you guys have all the plants, you have the capability. It's almost like I was a mayor of city for 12 years, smart cities, right? It's like uh, each base is its own city. Uh, each base has its capability of being able to be measured um, and you know looking at the sustainability. So when the military gets asked, what are you guys doing for the executive orders? You really have a true appreciation of, at the lowest level, it seems like. Yes. And it's, it's definitely helped me in my position now to have had the exposure to all of these different positions because I have relationships with folks who do all of this work and mm -hmm. I understand the demand mm -hmm. and I understand a technical aspect of each of those things. And the environmental is actually a big piece of modernization because there's a lot of considerations you have to take in place, especially when you're putting a new building somewhere. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of additional things that we have to do when we're building on government facilities. Mm -hmm. And I definitely don't think I would appreciate the amount of work or, or the people who were doing the work as much as I do if I hadn't been mm. knee deep in it when I was in the environmental coordinator position. Talk about the opening that comes up at AMC. So at JMC, I bounced around a little bit and found myself in the facilities piece and uh, was actually management reassigned into a facilities uh, chief role in which we started doing some of this OIB modernization. So... Um, initially a different person from AMC was up there and they were up there for a shorter amount of time and they came back and they said, Hey, I think you would really fit in on this team. Uh, the mission they're getting after is right up your alley. You have a great understanding of our sites. And so they wanted to send me up there on a detail to support, um, as an analyst. And that's what I started off as a Vulcan analyst, a data analyst. And I looked at the massive amounts of data that was supplied by all of our sites. And I spent my first couple of months, um, working, uh, with the LCMCs and the installations to make sure that our data was quality and that it was um, entered the right way and we were looking at the pictures the right way uh, and then developed a lot of the report that we ended up giving to Congress. Mm. So I spent my first, I think, six months up there as an analyst and working really hard with Ms. Wicker, who was the director at the time, and then Colonel Rich Martin, who was the deputy, and developed a great relationship with them, got to go to many more of the sites that weren't JMC related. And so at this point, I'm three sites short of seeing all of them. Um, and that part of that is because of moving into this role. I ended up, that detail ended and I went back to JMC and I was there for about three weeks when I got a call and they said, hey, you really got to come back up. Miss mm -hmm. um, Wicker's transitioning to be the um, EDCG. So the EDCG is the executive uh, deputy to the commanding general, and she is the highest civilian at AMC. So uh, she was the director, got moved into that role, which then fleeted up Colonel Martin, and he became the director, and he asked me to come back as his deputy. Um, so I've, I've had an opportunity to meet uh, Ms. Wicker and, uh, and, and Mr. Martin. But, um, it's it's got to be incredible to have the, that type of level of mentors, Amazing. especially Miss Wicker definitely has a reputation. You know, a lot of the people that I work with and knew her in the career before. Um, so, you know, you're kind of getting brought up uh, and, and mentored really in a very unique way uh, at that point. And um, when they start making the changes at that level, um, you know, are, are you having any idea of the significant path that could be before you at that point, or you're just like, Hey, I'm just trying to do my job. Not at all. I was just trying to do a good job and show up. And, and you're right. The two of them are amazing mentors and the amount that I have learned in mm -hmm. the last two years. I mean, I, I can't even imagine mm -hmm. the person like, it's hard to look back at that person compared to who I am now and, and the way that I've changed and the things that I've learned mm -hmm. as a result of being around these two, because they are just, a wealth of knowledge and two of the greatest leaders I've ever had the experience of working with. So mm -hmm. I find myself very, very lucky. But no, at the time, I mean, to be totally honest, when they first pulled me on the task force, I was terrified. <laughs> um, they were both very intimidating, but I will say yeah. that within a day of being there, Miss Wicker pulled me in her office and sat down and for an hour and said, who are you? What do you want to do? How can I help you? How do I get you there? I mean, and that mm -hmm. definitely, you know, Mm -hmm. eases your tension a little bit. Um, but they're also very high performing with high expectations. And so you, you develop a relationship with them and you want to do well. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that kind of pushes you to the next level also. And 
when they asked me to come back as the deputy, I was extremely humbled. And it was a very, it was a hard decision, to be honest. I mean, mm -hmm. to pick up my life from Iowa, where I lived at for over 20 years with my husband and all of our family is there. And I, I mean, I was an avid yogi and I had a <laughs> whole community of people that yeah. I, you know, worked with. And um, so I had to think really hard about it. And uh, my husband said, I'm in, let's go. And wow. we picked up and a year later, I'm the director. And it's, you know, it, wow. it was, has been very interesting. So Huntsville, um, I've been here a bunch. Um, you know, I joined IBM 2021. Uh, and again, got a really quick indoctrination of how important Huntsville is. Uh, Army's here, FBI, NASA. The, seems like a great community, too. Uh, you know, you can, you can kind of tell. I, I remember when I worked at Boeing and we were setting up the first C-17 base in Charleston. And yeah, I'm from Los Angeles and things are a little fast there. And I remember going to Charleston and pumping gas and I'm getting there and somebody goes, hey, I'm looking over and they're like, how are you doing today? <laughs> we were like, it was you know, like, I'm doing good. And then I'm, I'm, I remember calling my wife that night and going, man, I, I was creepy. People were talking to me. And, uh, and so, you know, but when you come, I almost, every time I come to Huntsville, I just, it seems like the type of people that are down here and, and it really is growing fast. It's mm -hmm. incredible how many, how much government is here. Yes. Uh, it's amazing because nobody in Huntsville is from Huntsville. Yeah. Very few people. Uh, it's, it's nice because you get a mix of the cultures from across the country and mm -hmm. you know, moving to East coast to West coast, people are very different. Mm -hmm. and I will say that what's very different for me is people are Midwest. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, everybody's nice. Everybody always says hi and asks you how you're doing, but it's really just saying hi. Mm -hmm. um, so when you say, how you doing down here, people kind of look at you strange because <laughs> They, I think you're actually asking them a question yeah. where people are, people are nice down here, but they don't ask you how you're doing. So yeah. you can tell people who aren't from Huntsville because they ask you how you are. <laughs> yeah. No, that's funny. That is funny. The, the quality of life though. But I, I know as you, uh, you're taking on this role, it's headquartered here mm -hmm. and, um, you know, um, talk a little bit just about AMC, just the organization here, um, you know, from your perspective. So, you know, as, as you've come in, you've taken now in, in this role that we're talking about, you're the director of OIB Modernization. You've kind of set out there that, you know, it's a $16 billion program over 15 years. Um, a lot of stuff going on. And I know that, um, you know, even as you and I talked, you know, earlier today, it was like, um, there's so many things that need modernized. It's like, where do you start? And, and obviously all the stuff that we're talking about is clearly your opinion of stuff You're you know, I'm not asking you on the, on the behalf of army or representing, but just from your perspective, AMC, it seems like a, a looking at this modernization, you know, where do you start there? As folks probably know, or at least have heard the, the OIB, the average age of our buildings is over 80 years old. And a lot of them were world war II esque. And so you'll go to our sites and it's, they don't look like what you would think manufacturing facilities look like. Mm -hmm. There may be pieces of it that look new, but um, there, there's some things that are not as attractive as you mm -hmm. would hope they are. But uh, the Army has always been able to get it done. We, we band-aid a lot of things and we've been able to be ready to, to support the warfighter to get material to the point of need. So when we're looking at modernization, we had to think about what, what's the most important piece. And that is that we need to be able to continue to, to execute that mission while we're trying to get ourselves to a better place. Mm -hmm. And modernization, yes, it means things like automating and getting to Industry 4.0 and um, robotics and things like that. But really modernization for us as a start was getting ourselves to a healthy state, getting our buildings to where I can support the automation, um, fixing the um, infrastructure so that I have ceilings and mm -hmm. roofs that don't leak and that I have enough electrical output to support some of this newer equipment and that I can get my IT to a place where it's secure and I can start having all of my instrumentation and machines talking to each other because mm -hmm. it's not where we are right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the reality. And so it was extremely difficult to get other folks to understand that because sometimes people think that they could just give me, you know, here's 16 billion bucks. That's what you need to fix it. Mm -hmm. But I can't do it that way right. because then I have to shut things down and then we won't be ready. Um, so it was figuring out a way to modernize, but also continue the mission. Mm -hmm. 
but also find ways to be more effective with the money that we have. Um, and then looking at the other services too and seeing how are they getting after it? Because we, now that we're speaking to them, we're experiencing a lot of the same challenges. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of moving parts to this, which make it a very complex problem. Um, the other piece being that what's very difficult is in the government, there's lots of different colors of money that do different things. And I can't just take money they give me mm -hmm. and apply it towards modernization. A certain type of money has to go to whether or not it's a new building or whether I'm going to do restoration to a building. Mm -hmm. And we're only given so many dollars a year. And so you have to spread it and get after the highest priorities first. So when you're thinking about how to get after modernization, there is a lot Mm -hmm. lot to it and a lot of stakeholders at that matter. And then again, working at the headquarters level, taking into consideration um, the input from the installation, which is two levels below us. And so we had to come up with a way to have the communication from the lowest level to the highest to make sure we're getting after Army senior leaders' priorities and giving them decision space, but also getting after those things that are of the most critical importance. Mm -hmm. And so that's really how we approach setting up our plan. Um you know, for, for people that, again, aren't on the inside of this, something that, you know, I always try to get back to is the, the, the kind of the why, why is this so important? And, and I think for people that watch the news and see, you know, the military takes on all these different roles, whether we're supporting NATO, whether supporting Ukraine, whether supporting different parts of the world. Um, when we do that, we definitely are doing our, our the good work, but it it's it's like having a new car and just taking some of the life out of it. You got to get it back in to get it mm -hmm. re-ready to go. And so when you guys talk about things like the warfighter, warfighter could be tank, could be a Jeep, it could be military armament. Mm -hmm. And it's really... Um, you know, and I think, too, what I wanted to make sure that, you know, it was kind of clear to kind of communicate, like, why is modernization so important? Because our ability to turn stuff back into the fleet or into these, the, you know, the, the different areas of combat or wherever this would have to be done um, needs this organic industrial base to be solid. And, um, you know, and I, I remember one of the first OIB organizations I went into just to kind of paint a picture from a civilian perspective was um, almost... A beautiful building, you know, I mean, historically beautiful, um, mixed machines, some modern stuff, some old stuff, some of the sensors and the things that could be turned on weren't because, like you said, the infrastructure wasn't there. So I, I think, like you said, it very tough. And the, the other thing I want to draw a parallel to is um, um, the Coast Guard kind of had a very similar problem with and they called it readiness. And they, you know, hey, we need to kind of invest in the readiness portion, like you said, different mm -hmm. colors of money. Um, something that I see a little bit, and, you know, you and I have talked about this before, kind of out just doing our work, is, you know, to cobble together the money for $16 billion, you break it up in 15 years, it's 1.1. I drive my IBM colleagues crazy because I'm the finance guy being from Homeland Security. So they'll come to me and say, hey, Troy, you know, they're, the, you know, the Army's going to do all this stuff. And it's like, well, let's go look at their financials. And it's public. I mean, you mm -hmm. can do this. So this is nothing that you and I sit back, you know, hey, Troy, let me show you this. It's like this, this is information that the public can look at. And it was interesting is the way that the funding for this OIB and the, the money that's out there puts a pretty significant responsibility eventually on probably you to then lobby because, you know, yes. let's say out of the 1.1 billion, if you take a look at what's out there, potentially about two to 300 million of that per year is really trying to, like I used to do at DHS, tax the components or pull some of the money in to use like their operating budgets to try and do some modernizations at the tactical level. Mm -hmm. And then the rest, you got to start to piece together in a budgeting programming process and palm the money and get ready. And then the other part, you need to send Stephanie to like the depot caucus in the congressional side or, and try to talk about the vision that you and the sequencing. And it seems like you, your job really is far away from the science now. You're going to be. So what, what's your view of that? And I know as you kind of work into this job and you're seeing that, does that, has that started to be something that consumes you is how do I help secure the funding? Yeah. So my favorite thing to do is find other people's money to spend because <laughs> we only get so much, right? Yeah. And any, anything that we add uh, to the budget is we 
somebody else has to pay for. Yeah. So any the army only gets so much money. And so if we give more to the OIB for modernization, that means somebody else gets less of something. Mm -hmm. And so when we created this plan, we we projected the one point one billion because that was about average of what we got and that would make nobody become a bill payer. And that was the plan. So everything else that we're getting we're trying to get using other people's money, which we call OPM all the time. Yeah, yeah. So I'm the, I'm the queen of OPM is what we're trying to get to. Yeah. So I can go and find other ways to, to resource this. And um, OSD has been extremely helpful because, again, all the services are trying to get after this. And so... And OSD, the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense. Yes. So it, it's, it's the overarching across all the services. Correct. Yeah. And they've helped us with a lot of the research and development and how to incorporate some of these new technologies into mm -hmm. the organic industrial base. And so that's been extremely helpful. Um, and then you'll see, you'll see a lot of folks coming down and asking, how can I help? And we have to be careful because really the way that this plan has been set up is it's a, it's a prioritized way to look at what the Army could do mm -hmm. within the resources that have been allocated to us. And so what we don't want to do is get ahead of senior leaders and take away their decision space by telling, you know, a certain um, – delegate from a certain state, I need these things. Mm -hmm. Because then if they go and push for that and, and we end up having to budget that, I've just taken away decision space from the Army. Mm -hmm. So we have to be really careful how we do that. But we also have to present the opportunities, right? So we use the the uh, Depot Caucus to mm -hmm. say, hey, if there was additional funding to become available, we could do mm -hmm. along the lines of these things. And we would prioritize based on getting after those that, that are the most critical. And mm -hmm. that's how we've approached this entire plan. And so it was originally a $16 billion plan but because of our ability to do that and to paint that clear picture and show that we have great insight into what we could do. We've actually been able to increase it to an $18 billion plan mm -hmm. because of some top line ads that we've gotten, some of in the form of supplementals that happened in 23, mm -hmm. especially with the 155 acceleration. So we've been able to expand our plan and we're always looking to do more, mm -hmm. uh, but again, just in a very careful way. Mm -hmm. And so I am no longer technical. That is very true. <laughs> But I definitely draw on my background when I create messaging for some of the things that we are doing because I have to be able to, in a very clear way, communicate what we're trying to get after. So take very technical things and make them very easy to understand and then speak to them in a way that elicits a response that will get people interested in what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I tell my team all the time we exist to communicate and educate people, mm -hmm. communicate to people the things that they need to know. Because as, as you've pointed out, a lot of folks don't understand what the 23 sites are, why they exist, mm -hmm. what the structure of the government looks like, or even that we can only spend certain types of money on certain things. And so when we can get other people to understand that and understand the gravity of the work we're doing, the more success we're able to get through, through that communication plan. I got a question for you. Just um, juxtapose a couple ideas. Mm -hmm. So, when you work at a Fortune 500 company like IBM, you know, and I have a certain business segment, I'm, you know, we're pushing to do stuff, and uh, I always tell my people, make sure you watch the quarterly earnings call. Our our president of our corporation, our CEO, gets up and with the CFO and talks about where we're at. Um, I'm not sure that that message always gets absorbed, but it's the guidance I tell people because, hey, this is the organization. This You're going to hear the high-level vision. It kind of helps you glue this together. I remember when I first started focusing on the OIB focus within the Army, um, being kind of a, a junkie for politics a little bit. I used to watch General Daly when he was the guy, and he would go up on the hill, and, you know, and it's – it's C-SPAN. I mean, you can watch it. It's not, it's not definitely uh, Netflix or anything like that, but it's definitely, you know, if you're into that type of stuff, which I would be entertaining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but you know, you're right. It's um, I would see him get asked like very specific questions of, and it's almost like uh, who's your favorite child? Like mm -hmm. he, he wouldn't, I mean, you would think like he can go in for the kill and he could have just mm -hmm. said, Hey, oh, I be, we need to modernize. Look, there's some wars going on, but he kind of restrained himself because he knew that, you know, he's picking one over the other. My question to you is like in your organization, you have such a big amount of money that's required to achieve your goal. Do you think like maybe you or within your organization, you guys are actually following the Netflix special happening and in Congress? Do, do you guys get involved with that? Yes. Um, or do you think um, it kind of loses its meaning? You know, it's sort of like what you said, like people didn't realize that they were working at TACOM. And, and, and now you're realizing, hey, we should tell them their mission 
and what they're doing is important. I was just curious because at your level, you're right at the game, like where it happens. And I was just kind of curious, do, do you guys track that stuff? Or maybe you're actually a participant in getting people ready for those meetings? We Both. So we, we track it very closely um, because decisions that they make directly impact us. Mm -hmm. And especially when you look at things like signature modernization platforms and if they're going to discontinue work on a platform, we need to relook at what did we put in our plan yep. in support of that platform? And was it only for that or do we, and we get rid of it or do we reshape it or was it in support of 10 things and this was just a piece of it, so we're fine. Uh -huh. um, so we have to pay attention to the decisions that are being made. We have to pay attention to the the policy that's being pushed out because in many instances it impacts our ability to execute um, most specifically environmental things. Again, if they're putting out um, executive orders to stop doing a certain or using a certain chemical, that's going to impact us. Mm -hmm. And so we may have to relook at how we're going to build a facility or how we're going to dispose of things as we're divesting of facilities. So those are very important. Uh, in the January to March timeframe, we are very, very busy because we support a lot of testimony for folks and mm -hmm. we get lot, asked a lot of very specific questions mm -hmm. for, for folks all across within the the building on the hill like who whoever's doing the test uh, testifying is we have uh prep for the vice for for the chief for the vice chief of staff yeah. of the army the chief staff uh we brief them regularly so they're tracking all the things that we're doing and they can go speak um in a very educated manner and say this is what we're getting after and this is why you can't tax the oib funds because if mm -hmm. you do you're going to take away this thing that's supporting mm -hmm. theater right now mm -hmm. so Yes, we are very involved and, and admittedly not something that I paid a whole lot of attention to yeah. when I was at JMC. But now that I'm here, yeah. daily updates on what's happening on the Hill and how is it impacting me? Yeah, no, I think that's fascinating. I, I appreciate you uh, giving that perspective. Um, hey, as we get ready to kind of close, um, one of the questions I had for you is um, obviously Army has kind of two types of folks in it, mm -hmm. the civilians as yourself and people in the uniform. Um you know, there was possibly a time in your career, you know, where you would sit back and go, you know, one over the other, or do I need to, you know, as, as, as you get more familiar, I know for me, I have a base in the city where I was the mayor and, and it would be a combination of, of, you know, military and civilians. And so I, I was familiar with that. Was, was there a hard decision kind of at some point in early in your career? Like if there's people out there that are trying to contemplate a career in federal service and a career between, you know, whether I go to any or maybe these are, you know, people, younger folks, um, anything that you would give as guidance or thought process on, on what made you choose the civilian path or did you ever consider a military path? And does, in the end, does it really matter as long as you're providing service to our country? So I think in my perspective, it doesn't matter. If, if what you want to do is provide service, you can do it effectively as a civilian or in the uniform. Um, I think it's a choice that's really based on the individual and what they're what they're trying to get after. For me, I went I got to go to college. I was lucky and jumped right into an, an adult career. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think about joining the military. I worked at JMTC for about six or seven years before I became a supervisor. And then I actually had a bit where I started to consider maybe I do want to, to join the military. And cause I worked with a lot of folks in the suit and I was like, mm -hmm. I, I want some of the things that they have because they have a lot of education mm -hmm. that's given to them. They have a lot of leadership training and they're given a lot of authority and, and earn a lot of respect. And I really admired that about a lot of the folks that I was working with. And they had this ability to get people to move towards something. And I really appreciate that because sometimes folks are most times resistant to change and it's mm -hmm. hard to convince people to do things differently than they have, but the folks in green tend to be able to get people to move. Uh, and I really, I, I wanted some of that. Um, my brother actually, um, joined the army and my junior year of college and came and visited me. And I had a long conversation with him about, should I switch over? And, and after a couple of a couple of times going back and forth, I decided to stay the path that I was on because I was already kind of moving towards mm -hmm. getting to that state, although it was going to take me a little bit longer, I think, um, mm -hmm. than had I taken the other route. But I will say that working at the headquarters now where it's a it's a pretty uh, it's a better ratio of green suitors to to civilians mm -hmm. and seeing some of the things that they can do. 
there's a lot of opportunities that they get. They're awesome. If you are looking for leadership training and, and having the ability to go and get things done and having an influence, that is an awesome career field. And, and they have some great opportunities. But as a civilian, I think surrounding yourself with those people and getting to work with them, mm-hmm. you can you can do some of the same things. But you also get to learn from them as well. Yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people realize, too, you know, you talked about the 23 OIB plants, depots, and arsenals, mm-hmm. primarily civilians. Yes. And, you know, and like you said, it gets greener as you go yes, up. Yes, it does. And uh, and so, you know, and, and I guess this is my last point. Um, you and I talked about this off mic. It's like when I got out of the Navy, I went to work at McDonnell Douglas and Boeing, and I was on a military program. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, where was the best leadership you ever saw in your career? And I think for me, it was at Boeing, especially in the military side where I came in, is they would hire colonels and above uh, to come in. If a colonel, they'd be a director. If they were, you know, a a flag officer, they'd come in as an executive. And they really carried themselves with that certain level of leadership. And, you know, and, and I did 10 years at Boeing, and I remember I left to go to Price Waterhouse and to do consulting, and and I, my, one of my rationale of wanting to do consulting was I didn't want to be married to uh, aerospace, and I'd finished my MBA and said, hey, I'm going to go into um, consulting because two things you got out of it. One is I can go see a bunch of different industries. You know, I was in aerospace. I could see entertainment. I can see con- industrial products, you know, fill in the blanks. I could see all the different ones. So that could give me more career opportunities. And the other thing is like, once you go in consulting, you're kind of off the grid. And then when you want to go back into industry, people are like, is this guy a director, an executive? You know, you have, you know, especially in commercial side, you know, I was in consulting dealing with Fortune 500 CFO CEOs, you're at the top. And so they, you know, so when you're playing with the, the group, the, sometimes they look at you as just part of that group. And so when I see some of the roles that you're doing and you're saying as it gets greener, I guess my question to you is like the leadership that you see, you know, as you work there in the difference, do you find that you get a lot? I mean, we talked about Miss Wicker. There's no doubt she's a civilian, mm-hmm. but on the military side, like the generals and stuff, what, what is your perspective on leadership in the military and what you get? Like you, you were talking about it. It's one, possibly one of the reasons why you considered going back or doing the uniform route, but I was just kind of curious your view. They have an un, a, a way of looking at the strategic piece that civilians sometimes struggle with. And I, I would guess, again, Stephanie's opinion, that they're, it's because of the way that they're educated and the way that they're brought up. Because I don't think a lot of civilians, if they stay in one place, have the ability to to see the bigger picture and how they're just a small piece of the puzzle. And as you continue to move up, that you need mm-hmm. to start thinking beyond the role that you're in mm-hmm. and how the things that you say and do can influence greater than what you are. Mm-hmm. And I think that the people in the green suits have an, an amazing way to see that mm-hmm. and to make decisions and move in a direction that really get after what the Army's priorities are. Mm-hmm. And it, I don't, I'm not going to say civilians can't do that because clearly they can. Miss Wicker's amazing at it. And there's many other folks at AMC who I think do a fantastic job. Mm-hmm. But as a whole, I think that they have a a better, the folks in the suits have a better way of communicating that to mm-hmm. everybody and sharing that vision. Mm-hmm. And and maybe it's the positional authority that they have and you're just more used to seeing it come from them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've found it inspiring and it's definitely changed the way that I think about things. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think had I not gone to AMC that I would have had that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I, I think for me, um, you know, even, you know, being out here and supporting the army or the Navy, any of the military says I do all sides of the federal government, but I, I have these deja vu moments of like seeing that type of leadership and being able to go through. And, and like you, I think, um, you know, I've seen all sides of it and there's, everyone has this one thing, but I think when I was a younger person, definitely left an imprint on me. Uh, you know, sometimes like I'll even to this day think, you know, uh, there was a three-star uh, general from the Air Force who who led the the part of the business I was part of. I still think, what would Tom Ryan do? You know what? And because of the way he would you know do stuff, you kind of get a picture in your mind of trying how how would he carry himself through that? And so, you know, if I'm still thinking about it yeah. <laughs> 20, 30 years later, it's pretty you know pretty good. I don't think I appreciated how much responsibility they have because yeah. being at JMTC, it's a colonel yeah. that that manages that, and that is a lot of responsibility for a colonel to have. It, thousand 
thousand plus employees and mm-hmm. entire systems and then reporting back to a four star general. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of responsibility that I never realized they had. And as I moved up, re- like looking at the enterprise that they manage, like the the one star at JMC has 16 sites. Yep. That's, you know, if there's a thousand person at a site, that's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of responsibility. And again, reporting back to a far, four star general. So mm-hmm. it's it's a lot to, to think about that I don't think was obvious to me until I got to look at it from a little bit higher seat and say, wow, that is, that's a lot of things that they're doing that I just didn't appreciate. Yeah. Well, Stephanie, I, I just want to tell you how appreciative I am for you coming on the show, sharing your, your career, your background, uh, hopefully educating people outside the federal market on the whole structure of the organic industrial base, OIB, you know, the, the acronym of people are hearing a lot about in, in the news. So I just appreciate all the work that you do for this country and, uh, and appreciate you kind of sharing your, your message today. So thank you. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks again for joining me today on the Ameritocracy Show. Be sure to follow me on social media and our website at troyedgar.com, where you can get more information and sign up for my weekly email. I hope you have a great week. 